you both are so wonderful at just opening up the world of food to everyone um, as writers. So how do you find that you write against food snobbery in addition to writing against all these other things that you brought up, like the, the listicle phenomenon, like having to do like service journalism. I think food snobbery is also something that you are writing against in an an amazing way. So how how do you do that? I mean, first and foremost, I really love that you say I've been called the unofficial writer in residence of the Cheesecake Factory because I for sure called myself that and uh, like emailed their public relations department, commanding them to make me their writer in residence. They obviously never responded. So I just started calling myself that anyway. And now I see it's starting to spread, which is perfect for me. But um, as far as like the question of snobbery, I, I wouldn't say that I write against it in a in even a very opinionated polemic sort of way. Like I think that it is just natural to me to enjoy good, simple eating and, you know, stuff that just isn't hard to make and really big, greasy, like American plates of garbage food. Like that just happens to be what I love. And there are a lot of people out there who love that food. It's, it's kind of the, the hoi polloi cuisine. And I appreciate being able to talk to my people. Like, I don't think of it so much as against snobbery as for the stuff that I like. I'm more likely to write about something that I have a loving relationship with than than to be critical about something. I'm one of those people, like if I'm playing a video game, I pick all the really polite dialogue options because I don't like to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't like to be critical. It does not feel good for me. So that's where against snobbery lands for me is like, that's just not who I am. And if that's who you are, you can do your own writing. That's cool too. That's great. That's really great. Um, I feel like I do write against snobbery a lot and I worry about it for myself um, because food writing is really a part of this sort of, um, it's about fresh and local and, you know, buying things from, you know, a green market. And uh, that's considered the uh, the the standard, like sort of the gold standard. If you're really somebody who cares about food, you know, you're not shopping at, you know, um, the crazy grocery store on the corner, you're shopping at Whole Foods or you're shopping at Trader Joe's or, you know, one of those, or you're going to the farmer's market or you're going out to the farm even better, you know, or you have a farm in your backyard. Those, those things are great. But like, for instance, um, when I was uh, during the pandemic, I had a bit of a, a, f- a food pantry in the front, in our front yard. And uh, a lot of that is in my book from next, for, that will be out next year. And um, I really got a real taste of how out of touch food writing uh, really is for most of the people who are just trying to fucking get dinner on the table. And um, I'll give you an example. Uh, My son's friend um, came over and uh, I have a chicken coop, of course, uh, you know, in my backyard. And I gave him, (laughs) I gave him, uh, you know, a dozen eggs and said, here, you know, I knew they were living in a weekly hotel. So uh, I gave him eggs and I said, you know, take these to your mom, you know, and, you know, I'm, you know, feeling all great about myself. And, um, and he said very simply, um, well, we can't cook food because there's so many roaches that just having food uh, in the counter, you know, uh, crumbs, that kind of thing just makes everything worse. So we basically buy pre-prepared food from, you know, either a convenience store or, you know, from someplace else where they, or they order out. Right. And that was really um, sort of the beginning of me really thinking like, what the fuck is wrong with you, Kim? Like, why are you writing about these sort of, you know, more lofty things like, you know, my pig roast, you know, that I, you know, threw together in the the backyard, you know, how, how irrelevant that is to so many people. And I think it was like a real game changer for me. And then I started thinking, I want to write about the food that actual people who aren't food writers or foodies are actually eating. And that became something that became really important to me because I feel like those people 
are left out of the writing of it. They're left out of the reading of it. We don't even think about those people in terms of um, you know who they are and what their experience is. Um, uh, I even had like during the pandemic, I would get all this canned food and I had never really cooked. I'm a pretty decent cook and I had never really cooked with canned food before. And I thought this is gonna suck. And we made some amazing dishes for the community out of just like canned potatoes or, you know, we made like a kick-ass mango salsa out of like canned mango. There was just something that I never did before. I just never, I always, you know, was like loftier or, you know, felt that it had to be, you know, different. And I really had to cut myself down to size a little bit because um, uh, it's a problem with all of food writing. It's really a problem, I think. Yeah, I think that uh, you're getting at something really important about just the proportions of it all. Like there is a disproportionate amount of writing about, you know, thousand dollar tasting menus and things of that nature. When you look at just how many people out there are eating that way, how many people out there are going to three different specialty stores to make a single meal, you know, not that many as compared to how much writing there is about food being eaten that way. And so I think that like, when you look at what, what sort of food writing is being promoted for the everyday person for whom food is not the cornerstone of their life, that writing is listicles, right? It's, you yeah. know, 10 junk foods stacked up against each other. Here's how they rank. And I personally feel that a person who is having those listicles and listicle grade pieces of writing marketed to them all the time, that person deserves better. They deserve more complex, thoughtful writing. I don't think so so little of like the average person, you know, living in a weekly hotel or, or some similar situation that I think that all they deserve to read is just like hastily slapped together, underpaid, unedited stuff. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, because that's what's out there now. And it's really, I mean, even like, even great publications like, you know, like Food and Wine, like some of the stuff that I've seen, I don't want to like call out, you know, like the glossies or whatever, but a lot of their stuff is listicles now. It's not, or like, or like sort of these sort of, um, they're not, they're not deep dives. They're not intricate. They're, they, you know what I mean? And and I feel like we we are missing that. Like we're missing because even though like your writing Rex is not like a, an investigative journalism kind of thing, it's a deep dive. It's a deep dive into like these cultural references. It's a deep dive into how people eat. It's like it's actually something that has some kind of tangible connection to it. And I think that we're just missing a lot of that. I think it's a very, very um, it's a it's a big miss, I think, in the industry. As you were talking, I was thinking about um, again your your Bobby Flay piece in Catapult Racks, um, and you said nobody is born julienning strips of red bell pepper. We all start off as the worst cooks in America. Um, and I think that's kind of what you're both getting at is like meeting people where they are um, with writing. Do you think that that's kind of the key to like making food writing? literary like bringing in the community kind of meeting people where they are yeah I think I mean I think it's about the community I mean just period it's about community making right and so it doesn't matter what community you're talking to I mean if you're if your community is you know um you know climate friendly mm -hmm. foods you know that's great but we need to like I want to be able to like learn more about that I want to be able to like get get involved in it and you know get some detail i don't know rax what do you think oh what happened we lost her i think you are muted somehow it wouldn't let me unmute myself i'm muted to call <laughs> uh okay i'm sorry i was frantically trying to unmute what was the question kim sorry <laughs> um yeah, Krista, reframe. <laughs> um, well, I think you're kind of getting at something that I wanted to to ask you both about in a similar vein is that idea of community. Um, you know, Kim, you've written very beautifully about like how food writing and talking about food can tell the story of a community here in Las Vegas. Um, you know, you wrote that piece 
in Desert Companion about home chefs. And then Rax, like, you've written so many pieces that touch on community. The one that, that comes to mind for me that's very a very niche community is the piece you wrote for Food and Wine about the chili head community, people who pursue super hot, hot sauces. Um, how do you use your writing to tell the story of either the community you're in or, you know, a niche community that you, that you want to respect as you write about them? Yes, community, that's where we were at. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, my general belief about it is that the way that you can really look deeply at people, especially people that, you know, aren't your closest comrades, right? Like writing about the chili head community, that's not a community I'm a part of. But I think that a good way to see more of them than you might normally is by looking at the way they eat. And particularly by looking at the way a community eats that sets them apart from adjacent similar communities. Like the, I mean, this is me pulling an example together on the fly, but like chili heads versus people who are really into wings. Like, that there's probably a lot of overlap there, right? And there's that show, Hot Ones, that I hate that, uh, that puts the two together. But I also think that like you could really go far into understanding more about these discrete groups of humans by looking at what's different between Chili Head and Wing Guy or Chili Head and, you know, guy who's really into some other niche food. Or, I mean, vegetarians and vegans. Like, two groups of people who have a lot of similarities, but there's one glaring difference in the way that they choose to eat. I think that's super interesting. I think it's really fascinating to look at people in terms of the decisions they've made for their, for how their community is going to behave, how their community is going to eat, that is different from how somebody similar chooses to behave, how someone similar chooses to eat. Yeah, this is um, this is really interesting. And the piece you're talking about, Krista, is How to Eat a City, which is in uh, Desert Companion. And interestingly, it's one of my favorite pieces. And it's also one that had no virality whatsoever. And I think no one read it. So, um, but one of the things I like about the piece is that um, uh, I, in, I basically went and had dinner I had four women in our community cooked me dinner. And I knew all of these women before and um, cooking with them and eating with them and talking with them opened up things that I never knew about them. Um, that th things came up, you know, about, you know, one of them's, her beloved mother died and, um, you know, she talked about, so the dinner became, she made the dish that was like her mother's dish. And then, so basically food isn't the thing. It's always about the people, right? It's always about telling that story about people, about community. And food is just a lens for that. But it's a great lens because people have a relationship to their food and their choices. And so, and or even like, um, or even the schism where people don't have a relationship. So like, if you look at a transracial adoptee, so maybe like somebody is, uh, was adopted, uh, was Chinese adopted into a white family. What does it mean if you don't have those cultural, um, if culture is like sort of, um, you know, how you, you're a sort of lived life, right? How then there's a schism between this sort of culture that you were taken out of and what you can experience now. And so those things, even it's not just the connections, it's also the disconnections. So all of those things are important and we should be exploring not just the things that like make eating together, cooking together, all those things create a community and a sense of commonality, but also how they disconnect us from things that are really inherent or important for us. Yeah, that sense of disconnect that you're describing, Kim, makes me think of um, Jaya Saxena's essay for Eater about the so-called lunchbox moment. Like you'll read often personal essays by 
people who, you know, one way or another did not fit into the communities that they were plunked into. And a big trope, I guess, in many of those essays is the lunchbox moment, the moment that, you know, little boy or girl who doesn't fit into their community opens up their lunchbox and takes out food that's incredibly dissimilar to what everybody else at the lunch table is eating and gets made fun of it. You know, your food smells bad, that looks gross, whatever. And uh, Jaya's point in that essay was that despite that being a trope, that is not something that, that she personally ever experienced and her feeling of disconnect from that disconnected perspective as somebody you know in a similar boat of Indian descent, but never having had that moment of feeling left out, feeling singled out for that reason. And so I think that like that for me is a really perfect example of writing into and around and behind a very particular type of eating community. You know, how have I experienced this? How have I not experienced this? And what does that say about me, about the other people involved in the scenario, about people who belong to all those communities? Like, I think that it's a really good, I guess, nexus from which to view all those different perspectives as food. That's a great example. That essay is a great example of that. It's perfect. Yeah, Jai is the best. <laughs> kind of tangentially related, speaking of communities, um, would either of you say that like experience with the service industry has influenced the way that you write about food? I know I know you've written about that, Rax. Like, Kim, I don't know if you have experience working in restaurants and I know you have experience being around them and people that work in them, but um, especially just thinking about the way like the pandemic has affected the restaurant industry, um, you know, and just the labor movement, people vocalizing like the way people are treated in that industry. How How is your experience with, with kind of like the actual workers in restaurants or being a worker in a restaurant affected the way that you write about food? Uh, I will say that I pitched a publication that I'm not going to call out here. I pitched them a story about the sorts of traditions that restaurant workers have developed around Christmas Day because, you know, increasingly more and more restaurants, at least in New York, but I think probably elsewhere, they do a Christmas Day service. They don't close for the holiday like they probably did in years past. And I pitched this story about these alternate holiday traditions and the editor like asked me what my evidence was that those traditions exist. And, you know, not his fault really, but I I worked in restaurants just about my whole life before, you know, stumbling onto this writing racket. And I am in fact working in a restaurant now. And so like, you really see as an employee in that industry, how out of touch so many people in media are when it comes to just the daily realities of people who make the food that they are that that they serve them, you know, it's there. I don't know if anybody in here has seen the menu. Please see it if you haven't. I, it's like my favorite movie of the year. But there's a scene where a chef says to a working class restaurant customer, like, there are people who serve and there are people who eat, and you look to me like a person who serves. And uh, that just hit so hard for me. This idea that like no matter what's going on in food writing, what trends are, are common to food writing, they don't always bear any resemblance to other elements of food serving and food cooking and food work. And I think that that's something that's really important to bear in mind if you wanna get into food writing or if you want to get into it from a position in the food service industry, you have a valuable perspective of what it looks like from the inside. And it, it surprises a lot of people. A lot of people just don't have that experience, don't have the language for it, don't know what it looks like. I would yeah, love I to think, read that essay okay. that you just described pitching. If anyone picks it up, I don't know if there's any big time editors in the chat tonight who wanna <laughs> give me some work, but I would love to write that for you. <laughs> It's probably important to note that that one of our 
best food writers is in this room and has a restaurant day job. So let me just, she has to have a day job to be able to write about food. I mean, that's part of the sort of, um, and we're, and we're still in a very, um, we're still in a very, uh, I think a lot of people are, are still writing about, uh, you know, startups and uh, chef owners, and we still sort of, you know, uh, the feet of chefs. I mean, maybe it's changing a little bit, but I think there's that celebrity um, that there, that's why I wrote the home cook piece, right? Because I wanted to highlight this is cooking. Like you don't have to be in a restaurant to cook amazing food. You can, you don't have to uh, be a chef to cook amazing food. I, one of the things I remember from having a food pantry um, was that I got a note from uh, someone who was a server at uh, David Chang's Mamafuko here in Vegas. And she, at the time we were going and picking up fresh vegetables from grocery chains and bringing them back. So we had like a green market and really, really like healthy food for people to choose from. And she left this note and said, I stood on the curb and cried because I hadn't seen a vegetable in weeks. And I thought, wait, is, is David Chang not getting like the appropriate amount of money to pay his workers and tie them over? Is that not happening? Because these large restaurant groups got a lot of money. So, you know, there's all these things. And also there's an access issue. Nobody wants to like piss off, you know, that magazine, that chef, that, you know, that, that restaurant, that, that kind of thing. And so there's all these issues around that as well. So I think you're absolutely right that there's this big um, labor issue in restaurants. The fact that tipping itself is like a holdover from reconstruction and that tipping all happens because white people didn't want to pay uh, black people uh, for their work in the kitchen, and we still have a tipping system um, where where people work and are dependent on the generosity of their customers to be able to make bank, um, because the business model for restaurants is so fragile. Um, so there's all kinds of issues, and if we're not talking about these issues, then we're not really writing about food because they're all integral to you know to moving this forward. Yeah, I mean, to your point, and then to bring in the pandemic and how it changed food writing, I mean, we really saw two significant new types of food writing emerge as the pandemic went trucking along, right? We saw these overwrought elegies for restaurants and dining out and, you know, the, this is what they took from us kind of like, to me, melodramatic. I mean, I love a good restaurant, but let's all calm down. <laughs> and there's that. And then, as you said, Krista, there's also increasingly many labor stories that point to the conditions that restaurant workers have always had to deal with. It's not like the pandemic kicked in and all of a sudden they have to do all this demeaning, not up to my pay grade shit. Like they've always had to do that shit. And it was just very easy to sweep under the rug and, you know, as long as you're having a good time eating in the restaurant, you don't really have to think too hard about what's going on with the people cooking the food. As long as you're getting your steak, you don't really have to think about the kinds of scraps they're getting for family meal. And it, it used to be this matter of like, I don't see it. It's not happening. I'm sure that that's still the case, but it's just it's less and less ignorable as time goes on. I think Eater in particular has done a really good job of like bringing workers' perspectives into the mix and not just like front of house workers who speak perfect English, not just the people in comparatively good shape at these super high-end restaurants where they're making great tips. You know, they brought in all these people from, from the kitchen and, you know, guys who risk their lives delivering food on their bikes so that you can have a cheeseburger in 20 minutes. Like, these are people that I think we got to hear from a lot more during the pandemic than we have ever in my own memory. Yeah, I, I look, I would agree with that. And I would also say, like, there's also that other end, too, which is like Alice Driver is writing a book about 
um, what happened to uh, meat processing workers. I'm not exactly sure exactly what the book is. I haven't read it, but um, basically it's also about the labor behind the scenes, how our food gets to our plates and, you know, who's, who's doing that? You know, who is making, who is getting that, like those organic Brussels sprouts to, you know, to Whole Foods. And, you know, th those things are really important and we need to be talking about those things. And I think there's just not enough of it. Or it happens at like Civil Eats where it's like, this is where like a literary, um, a literary touch to food writing could really make a difference. Because if we can tell the stories of people, then it's not just like, um, uh, you know, like a like a straight journalism piece where maybe you want maybe it feels like homework a little bit. But if we can actually tell the stories of people who are like going through these things so that we can read them and connect to them and make a connection through the writing, then then that's where change happens. Right. Because we read about it and we go, this cannot go on anymore. So really quick, I just want to say if anyone wants to put any questions in the chat, um, you're welcome to. We're at, we've got about 12 minutes left. Um, so definitely want to make sure anyone who has questions gets those questions answered. But this is a great discussion. Oh, we have a question from Taryn Hutt. Hi, Taryn. I know Taryn. Uh, thoughts on the millions of recipe pages with writing that leads into those recipes? Great. Great question. This is a great question. <laughs> um, yeah. That's great. Rex, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't always love to read it. Although, you know, who does sick recipe copy is Deb Perlman from Smitten Kitchen. I read hers every single time. And there are people whose I read consistently. But by and large, to my mind, you got to make money off these things somehow. And that's what SEO has decided is necessary. That's why, like, whenever you Google anything now, the first thing that comes up is an obviously fake website. Like, you'll Google how to cook an egg. And then the website's like, people have been eating eggs for millions of years. What is an egg? Like, all these dumb sections. And it's a similar thing with recipe writing, you know? Like, there are people who do it because they take it seriously and want to and there are people who do it because they feel like they gotta and I don't know I don't hate it <laughs> <laughs> so that's a very it's actually it, I, I think Rex has a very um controversial opinion about this because <laughs> if you said that on Twitter like a hundred thousand recipe writers would like would like come in and kick your ass or try to, you know, that's, this is sort of what happens. Um, I agree with you. Um, but I will say this, uh, I can, I really want to support, uh, writers where they are. And if you want to tell me about your grandma from Czechoslovakia, and that's how we got to this stroganoff or whatever, um, I can either read it and enjoy it, or I can scroll right to the recipe. And so my feeling is, um, you know, let people just, you know, my 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 older daughter just says, let me live, you know. And I, I always <laughs> like that's like my new thing, like just let people live, you know. If they want to write a long treatise about their Czechoslovakian grandma, I mean, okay, you know, just scroll down to the to the recipe. That's how I sort of look at it. Just let people live, write their thing. Um, I don't always want to read it, and but sometimes I do. So. Yeah. I think that's how most people deal with it. Like, honestly, every once in a while, I see one of those that just captures my attention. Not often, and it's fine. Like, I remember like Molly Wisenberg used to like write some really beautiful, like, um, and that was that whole like blogging era where you got really beautiful writers like writing. And there was, that's when the model got set, which was like, I'm writing about the thing and then boom we're into like you know my uh my danish my cheese danish recipe right that's how that worked and it became like a form but that form it, which was once liberating is now a little claustrophobic totally yeah i agree yeah so adam lawrence has a question for both of you has any particular work of literature poetry or especially novel informed your food writing Ooh, I don't know that I can help you with uh, 
poetry or a novel, but this is still a very literary book, I think. It's more literary than it is just food service. Uh, Bill Buford's Heat, which I will give the important caveat that this is a book about Mario Batali and that this was before Mario Batali was a known predator. And the book goes into a bunch of behavior that is very much that of a predator. So if that's not your thing, I get it. I don't love reading those parts so much, but it's just got to be one of the most lushly literary books about food that I've ever read. I still go back to it all the time. It's just beautifully, beautifully written. Um, so I, one of the things I think about a lot is um, it's a, a novel by, I think her name was Laura Esquivel. Um, I know it from the movie, which was uh, in the 90s. Um, uh, called like water for chocolate yeah and, um I loved that movie so much it won an Oscar for uh, foreign language film that year um but that's a perfect example of like um it's not about food but food was like a character in it and it you know it was about traditions and domesticity and wanting to live your life and then your obligation to um to tradition and uh, things your your family expects from you, but it it was all about the food at the same time, and the food represented this sort of character, and it felt um, it just felt lovely, and to me that felt like food writing to me. That felt mm -hmm. like it was about food, and then not about food at all. <laughs> Benjamin Bishop has a question: What came first, learning to write or learning to cook? Oh. I mean, I've been a writer since I was, since I learned how to write, that's what I wanted to do. But the same is true for cooking. I mean, ever since I was a really little kid, I've been very interested in what goes into cooking. I was, I was the classic kid, like hanging out underfoot while my mom would make dinner. So I don't know that either came first. I think that uh, I learned to eat first. That's what came first. Um, 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 so my writing is really different now that I know how to cook. Um, I certainly could write about food before, but really understanding food, uh, the science, how it comes together, failing at it, uh, feeding people, um, all those things, the sort of mechanism of doing it, how meditative it is, uh, for me, um, except when my kids are in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> and then it's really not. Um, uh, and, and how sometimes it's a fight and sometimes it's, um, you know, you're pissed off and you, you know, overboil something and it's awful and how connected cooking is to emotion. And, you know, I recently told my daughter Lucy that if she was, she was angry at her boyfriend and I said, you can't cook this dinner while you're angry because the food will just taste like complete shit. And I was right, it did. So, um, so, you know, those things, I'm a bad, I'm, I think I'm a different writer now after I've learned to cook. Do you feel like the way you describe food has, has changed as you've learned more? Totally. I mean, yeah. don't you, don't you think that's true? Because I actually can explain it. Like I actually yeah. understand what happens enough on the stove to actually be able to talk about it. And do you find that as well? Yeah, totally. I, as I became a more proficient cook, I started noticing that a lot of restaurant reviews will like do what I think of as cop outs. They will use words to describe food that aren't really food words, but also aren't distant enough from food words to be to seem like plausible metaphor, if that makes sense. Like words like uh, rich come up a lot, stuff that of roughly that caliber and like there's nothing wrong with using it I use that word all the time but I as we've been talking about all night like if you want to do a more literary minded like deep dive focused form of food writing I think that's the first thing that's got to go is the the everyday descriptions of food that I used to lean on like you you want to really get inside how something tastes you want to get inside how it's prepared in a way such that it becomes meaningful so that it does double duty because there's nothing better than reading a great description of food but you don't want it to just be a great description of food you want it to be something meaningful 
which I think as I've become more proficient has become more possible for me. Yeah, there I is something that. about like, there is some, I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. There is something, I just wanna say, th there is something about, about being a food writer that's a little like being a dance writer because uh, I started out as a dance writer. And when you have to like um, um, write about movement, it's similar, it's really hard like to bring that dance into the writing. And so I think the same, it's the same with food. How do you bring that beautiful thing that's like in front of you or that horrible thing or whatever it is, <laughs> and then bring it in so that everybody can like be there with you uh, in the moment, which is I think what you're saying. I think that's like, exactly the challenge of food writing. Do we lose Krista? Ooh, I want to read that WAPO piece. Oh, Le Diplomat. I'm from DC. I used to go there sometimes. It's very popular with people who are 20. <laughs> so I think we've got time for one more question. I see a great question from Sarah Munn. Any thoughts on food writing in fiction, i.e. novels featuring chefs or the restaurant industry? I have a hard time finding fiction that nails it on the authenticity front and the best food writing I've come across is nonfiction. I got nothing. Me too. <laughs> I, got nothing. I can't, I, I mean, not, maybe it's just being yeah. on the spot, but I'm blanking. Yeah. I mean, I, I just don't think that, um, I don't think the food community embraces non er, embraces food in fiction and considers it real food writing. I think it exists, but I don't think anyone would label it. Uh, this is by the way, not what we should be doing. I'm just saying that I think that this is part of the limitation of food writing, that we feel it's a nonfiction sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one thing that I had wanted to ask you both before we close out that I think you kind of just answered brilliantly is what advice you have for literary writers who want to write about food. And it sounds like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like that advice is to cook because it's super meditative and it teaches you how to accurately describe food in a non-cliche and beautiful, authentic way. Do you have any other closing thoughts on that advice for people that want to write about food in a literary way? I would, I would say write about people and bring the food in as a, either as its own character or as a way to um, like create, okay, I'm going to use Rax's word, to create some richness um, <laughs> around, sorry, I, that word that was stuck in my head. I'm so like, I'm so like, <laughs> If I hear something, I have to use it. Um, uh, I just think um, that if you write about people, then, and food becomes a part of that or it becomes a character of its own, you're always writing about people in the end. That's, food writing is really just, um, you know, it's, it, it's just writing about people. That's all it is. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I would agree wholeheartedly. Every single story about food is when you break it down to its constituent parts, it's a story about the thing that every one of us has to do every day. And like, there's your entry point, right? It's something that you do every day. It's something that all your friends and people on the street that you pass by, they all do every day, multiple times a day. So what's the point that you can make about this grand human tradition, like this grand animal tradition? Everything has to eat. That's, that should be exciting, I think, for a writer is to find that specific plot of land to stand on and say, like, this is what food is, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and don't be afraid to write about food in a way that's ugly. I, I yeah. find too much, you know, and this is the way that Rax's writing is really different and that I love so much, is that she's not worried about it being pretty. And I think, you know, we, we live in a world where social media has made food pretty, um, and it has to be pretty, but I think the most interesting parts of food writing or are the disconnects and the schisms. And I think if you focus on those, um, it'll stand out because hardly anybody is doing it. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you both so much. Um, this has been amazing, a dream for me personally. I'm starstruck by both of you. So this has been great. Um, and everyone else, thank you for being here. Thank you for your great questions. 
Um, I encourage you to read Kim and Rax's work by Rax's book, Tacky, by Kim's book when it comes out. Um, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please support these great writers and please tune in for more of our virtual programming. Um, again, Nikwa next week talking about podcasting as audio storytelling and, and more to come. Thank you both. Have a great day or night, wherever you're tuning in from. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. For